closed door meeting, President Trump huddles with leaders from both parties as the partial government shutdown reaches its 14th day. Fight for the unborn. The new Congress has convened just a few hours, and already there's a heated debate on abortion. Clergy abuse crisis. A bishop working at the Vatican is under investigation. We have the details from Rome. And supporting abuse victims. What one of the most popular Catholics is saying about how to compensate survivors. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, January 4th, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Jason Calvi in for Lauren Ashburn. No deal. Two weeks into a partial government shutdown, and President Trump invites lawmakers back to the White House to negotiate. The president stands by his demand for border wall funding, but Democrats aren't budging. White House correspondent Mark Irons tells us about this shutdown stalemate. Mark? Good evening, Jason. President Trump met with Democratic leaders for about two hours here at the White House, but they still could not reach a deal on funding border security to end the government shutdown. And President Trump says he's prepared to keep the government closed as long as it takes, even months or possibly years. Did you say that? And I is did. That your, I did. Is that border your assessment of I did where we are? That. Absolutely, I said that. I don't think it will, but I am prepared, and I think uh, I can speak for Republicans in the House and Republicans in the Senate. President Trump called the meeting with Democrats productive, but they described it as contentious. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer says Democrats are focused on ending the partial government shutdown. The bottom line is very simple. We made a plea to the president once again. Don't hold millions of Americans, hundreds of thousands of workers hostage. Open up the government and let's continue the discussions. So you see the major difference unfolding here. Democrats say they won't discuss border security until the government reopens, and the president says he won't agree to reopen the government unless he receives funding for a wall. And negotiations over this shutdown may continue into the weekend. The president says he's invited Democrats to bring their own negotiators, whoever they want, to meet with his designated working team. That includes Vice President Mike Pence, the Secretary of Homeland Security Kirsten Nielsen, and White House Senior Advisor Jared Kushner. Jason. Okay, White House correspondent Mark Irons. Thanks, Mark. And the House funding bill now heads to the Senate, where it faces strong opposition. Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he won't put it up for a vote. Republicans in the House criticized Speaker Pelosi for using this bill to cut pro-life protections. On page 1021 of the bill passed yesterday in the House, Democrats reverse President Trump's Mexico City policy, freeing up U.S. aid dollars for overseas groups that perform or promote abortions. And we are now going to spend money to fund abortion programs in foreign countries for the purpose of family planning. We probably shouldn't be spending money overseas funding abortion for family planning. Yesterday, as she was once again elected Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi referenced St. Francis, the patron saint of her hometown, San Francisco. Republican leader Kevin McCarthy criticizes her words as posturing, writing, Speaker Pelosi quoted a prayer by St. Francis, Lord, make me a channel of thy peace. Hours later, Speaker Pelosi and House Democrats voted to allow foreign aid money to be used to perform and promote the violence of abortion overseas. Republican Vicki Hartzler of Missouri echoes McCarthy. I thought it was poor of uh, Nancy Pelosi in her uh, speech yesterday for Speaker to quote uh, St. Francis and then in the next breath and a few hours later support uh, funding for abortion. And if you really care about life, if you care about children and surround yourself with them for the photo, then you should also protect life uh, in your actions with your spending. Speaker Pelosi, who identifies as a Catholic, took part in the ceremony yesterday hosted by the pro-abortion group Emily's List. She spoke out against pro-life supporters of President Trump. Some people were willing to overlook so many things that they would normally find objectionable for one reason, to prevent a woman to have the right to choose. The spending bill approved by the House came from the Senate Appropriations Committee. There are two Republicans who support Planned Parenthood voted with Democrats to reverse President Trump's Mexico City policy. And it's time to set your calendars for the President's State of the Union. New Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi invited the President to speak. The date? January 29th. It'll be his second State of the Union. Last year, he talked about God several times. 
he also touted his administration's efforts to protect religious liberty. The House of Representatives votes to keep a Jesuit priest as its chaplain. Lawmakers again approved Father Pat Conroy. He's filled the role for more than seven years. The priest briefly resigned last year. He said he was pressured to quit by then Speaker of the House Paul Ryan. Ryan faced backlash and then reinstated the priest. The U.S. Bishop's week-long retreat is in its third day, and the group's leader sends a message to Pope Francis. Cardinal Daniel DiNardo asks the Holy Father to pray for them. The head, of, the head of the Diocese of Galveston, Houston, also says the bishops carry the pain and hope of all who felt let down by the abuse crisis. The Vatican confirms an Argentine bishop isn't working at the Holy See while under investigation. Priests accused him of sexual abuse and other problems. In July 2017, Bishop Gustavo Zanqueta resigned from leading the Argentine Diocese of Iran. Pope Francis in December 2017 then named him assessor of the Vatican's office managing real estate and financial investments. Alan Holdren is the EWTN Rome Bureau Chief. Alan, as we know, Pope Francis is from Argentina. So how close is his relationship with this 53-year-old Bishop Zanqueta? Jason, Bishop Zanqueda reportedly got to know Pope Francis, and then Cardinal Bergoglio, when the future pope was president of Argentina's Catholic Bishops' Conference, and Zanqueta was the body's secretary. Zanqueta's appointment as Bishop of Oran, Argentina, was among the very first appointments to bishop that Pope Francis made after he was elected in 2013. Then in the summer of 2017, Zanqueta asked the pope to be released from his diocesan duties because he had difficult relations with his priest and said he was unable to govern the clergy. His request was granted by Pope Francis within days. Zanqueta told the people of his diocese then that he was stepping aside for health reasons and said he would go off to seek treatment. Now, the bishop spent some time in Spain before surfacing again in the Vatican in December of 2017 when the pope created a special position for him as assessor in the APSA, which is the Vatican department that oversees the investments and properties of the Holy See. Wow, so, so what happens now? Well, right now, Bishop Zanqueta is under a preliminary, pre preliminary investigation after priests of the Diocese of Iran have accused him of sexual misconduct um, and abuses. Uh, if these are deemed credible, a special Vatican commission for bishops uh, will be put together to further investigate the case. The Holy See Press Office's interim director, Alessandro Gisotti, released a statement to journalists today saying that the diocese is collecting testimonies right now uh, to, to see if these accusations against Zanqueta are indeed uh, credible. They were made against him just this last fall. Uh, the Argentine newspaper El Tribuno reported that the, the accusations were brought forward by three priests of the Diocese of Oran and their abuses of power, economic abuses, and mismanagement and also sexual abuses, they brought those to the nuncio, uh, the papal representative to Argentina. Uh, to be clear, according to the Holy See Press Office, that although these accusations, uh, he had accusations against him uh, that were previous to this, they were of authorit authoritarianism uh, by uh, his, his local priests. It wasn't that they knew of these sexual abuse uh, accusations when he resigned in 2017, and Pope Francis uh, didn't know about these uh, when he created the position for Zanqueta in the Vatican later that year. I'm just thinking of as all these allegations of abuse continue to erupt and be leveled against clergy internationally, just wondering how could this latest case affect Pope Francis's pontificate? Well, Jason, if the bishop is charged with abuses of power and sexual abuse, the apparent friendship between Pope Francis and Bishop Zanqueta could raise new questions for Francis. Uh, essentially, Jason, given his evident wish to help the bishop by intervening multiple times and even creating a position for him in the Vatican, uh, could be a real source of problems for him. All of this coupled with the management of the sex abuse crisis in Chile last year and the case of the former Cardinal McCarrick of Washington, D.C., this could mean yet another storm for this pontificate heading into the summit on sex abuse that Pope Francis has convened for the end of February. It also, it also might uh, add some more pressure to include uh, relationships between bishops and seminarians in the discussions in that February summit. Well, I know you'll be watching that very, very closely. Alan Holdren, EWT and Rome Bureau Chief, thanks so much. Thank you, Jason. North Korea's top diplomat in Italy and his wife remain in hiding. It's possible they defected, but a Catholic priest who met Jo Song Gil says he never thought the man was unhappy. Accoglienza, quindi mi sembrava che questo faceva parte del suo modo di essere. 
Father Bronino de Tofol also says their meeting last year was very friendly. The acting ambassador and his wife went into hiding a few weeks before their work in Italy was ending, back in November. A high-profile defection would be an embarrassment for North, Carolina's, North Korea's leaders. Catholic bishops in Congo urged the country's election commission to reveal the results of the long-delayed presidential election. But the government criticizes the remarks, saying they could lead to violence. Voting took place last Sunday, two years after it was originally scheduled. Longtime President Joseph Kabila, Kabila delayed the vote several times. Catholic leaders helped negotiate this new election. A Catholic priest kidnapped on Christmas Eve says he was saved by prayer. Father Kajitan Apa and another priest were ambushed in Nigeria and held for four days. Their kidnappers let them go when they learned of a massive manhunt. Father Kajitan says prayer kept them alive in the bitter cold with little food or water. Coming up, analysis on Nancy Pelosi's return as Speaker of the House and the opposition she faced from her own party. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Jason Calvi in for Lauren Ashburn. California Democrat Nancy Pelosi has made history as one of the few to become Speaker of the House twice and the only woman to hold the position. She retook the gavel yesterday, despite opposition from her own party. Pennsylvania's Connor Lamb was one of 15 Democrats supporting other people or voting present. It's being described as an unusually high number refusing to back Pelosi. Let's talk about this with Dr. Matthew Green, professor of politics at the Catholic University of America. He's also associate fellow at the Institute for Policy Research and Catholic Studies. Professor, welcome. Thank you for having me. So for 70 years, from 1925 to 1995, no majority party House members ever voted against their nominee for Speaker, but now we've seen a lot of defections. Why is that recently? Well, there's a number of reasons why that's happening. I think one of the biggest ones is that the Speaker is becoming a much better known figure and, and in, in the process um, is uh, subject to more negative ads, more criticism. In other words, the polarization that we're seeing around uh, in a lot of ways in, in American politics is now extending to the speaker. And so what happens is speakers become unpopular with a lot of voters. And members of Congress feel some pressure, uh, particularly from certain districts, to vote against the nominee for speaker. So 15 people in the Democratic Party voted against Speaker Pelosi yesterday. Why was that? And do they face risk now that they voted against her? So there's a few things that explain why a member of Congress was more likely to vote uh, or say they would vote against Nancy Pelosi. One of them is if they were either more conservative or their district was more conservative. Another is if they were a more junior member. Uh, in other words, they felt kind of like this is, you know, voting for a senior member of leadership when they're young and they want to see change in the party. And then another is if they were elected by defeating an incumbent member of their party. So they're kind of an outsider. Uh, and so those three things independently help explain why a Democrat would say, you know, I just can't vote for Pelosi. And Pelosi at that time, I mean, she, she there was dozens of people originally back in the fall that said they're going to vote against Speaker Pelosi or Nancy Pelosi to be Speaker. She, one by one, was able to pick these people off. So what was her strategy to, to win the votes? Uh, she did lose 15 Democratic votes yesterday, but she was able to pick off so many votes yesterday. As right. Well. So a lot of people in the fall were saying, I'm not going to vote for Nancy Pelosi, or more accurately, they were saying, I don't feel comfortable or I'd like to see change, which is a vague enough statement <laughs> that after the election, they weren't really going against their word by saying they would vote for Nancy Pelosi. Those who were left, there were about 27 Democrats who said, no, I'm just not going to vote for her. Uh, and what Pelosi managed to do in part was make deals with these uh, Democrats, either giving them a committee or agreeing, uh, probably most significantly agreeing to term limits for the speaker. Uh, it's sort of vague language, so it's not clear how long it would be, but it was sufficient to get Demo some Democrats to say, fine, we're going to see change at the top eventually, so we'll vote for you now. Why was that able to help some people get on board? Well, one of the grievances that a lot of Democrats had towards the leadership and, and frankly, really towards Nancy Pelosi, uh, although all the leaders, top leaders were this way, was that they had been in office for quite some time. And there was a sense that there was a lack of turnover and an inability of more junior members to have a chance to lead the party. And so by agreeing to these term limits, in effect, Pelosi was saying, I recognize that. We do need to have change. I won't be here forever, which she had always said was the case. And so the agreement said two years with the option of two more. 
And the advantage of that is that she's not a lame duck speaker. She might be there for two more. She might not. Um, but at least there's some wiggle room there so members can say, good, somebody new will be the leader of our party in the foreseeable future. Well, I have a bunch of more questions I want to ask you about today. I know you have a couple of books coming out on leadership in the House. We'll be checking that out. But thank you so much, Dr. Matthew Green, professor of politics at Catholic University of America. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Cardinal Timothy Dolan wants to make it easier for victims of sex abuse to receive aid. In an op-ed in the New York Daily News, he says a proposed measure in New York to compensate survivors should build on the successful model used by the church. He adds the focus should be on healing rather than breaking organizations or institutions. He also says the proposal's statute of limitations should be more broad. Up next, Democrats are now in control of the House of Representatives. Critics say the party will target religious freedom. We'll discuss. Welcome back. I'm Jason Calvi in for Lauren Ashburn. A judge in Kansas strikes down the state's attempt to ban one type of abortion. A telemedicine abortion is when a woman talks to a doctor via a video chat, and then the doctor prescribes abortion-inducing drugs. The judge in the case says the new law was legally unenforceable. For more on this story and pro-life reaction, visit our partners at catholicnewsagency.com. Democrats take control of the House and vow to push for passage of the Equality Act. That bill would explicitly add sexual orientation and gender identity to the list protected by civil rights law. Let's take a look at this bill with Monica Burke, research assistant at the Heritage Foundation. Monica, welcome. Thank you for having me, Jason. So this bill covers discrimination in broad areas of life, including employment, education, housing. How would this passage of this bill impact the country? Yes, so this bill would have a sweeping impact on federal anti-discrimination law. What it could potentially mean is it could potentially mean a nationwide preferred pronoun policy. It could potentially mean... What does that mean, pr pronoun policy? Yes, so we've seen conflicts where people are being compelled by the government to use the preferred pronouns according to someone's preferred or self-identified gender identity against what their biological sex is. So we've already seen there was, for example, a teacher in Virginia who was fired not even for using the biological pronouns of someone who wanted to use their preferred pronouns, but simply from abstaining from using pronouns altogether. So potentially this bill could implement a policy like that that would force people to use preferred pronouns against their conscience from the national level. So the supporters of this law say, though, it's going to stop discrimination. What would you say to them? We would say that this act simply doesn't deliver on its name. The Equality Act ultimately perpetuates inequality by forcing people to violate their consciences, by putting people in compromising positions that violate their privacy rights and their safety. So this bill could also impose a nationwide bathroom bill, which would open up sex-specific facilities to people of the opposite biological sex, which obviously poses extreme concerns for women and children's safety. And then this bill, one other thing that it could do is impose a national health care mandate. So it could force doctors, nurses, hospitals, and insurers to pay for and provide drastic sex change surgeries and hormone treatments. So this bill is, it, it would have sweeping implications for average Americans. That last point about impacting hospitals, would that mm -hmm. possibly force Catholic hospitals? Would they try to force Catholic hospitals to provide some of these treatments then? Yes, so unfortunately that's already happening. There are two lawsuits where Catholic hospitals have been sued for failing to provide sex change surgeries. And so we should expect to see more of these conflicts of conscience, more of these lawsuits should the Equality Act become law. So we, you'd mentioned the schools and the bathroom bill. Uh, how would this impact uh, schools across the country as well? It would have a devastating impact on schools. So we've already seen a case out of Georgia where a five-year-old kindergarten student was assaulted by a male classmate in her, in her bathroom. And basically when her mother went to the school and said, hey, I would like to keep this boy out of the female-only spaces, what the school said was, according to our policy, this student is allowed access to the facilities of the gender that he identifies with. So under a national policy like the Equality Act, we could expect to see more conflicts like that one. Speaker Pelosi yesterday in her remarks on the floor after taking the gavel said she promised to take this up for a vote. It would likely then fail in the Senate because in the Senate it would need 60 votes, which is almost impossible with, with all the conservatives in the Senate. But we're definitely monitoring this. Thank you so much for joining us. Monica Burke from the Heritage Foundation, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And f finally tonight, the United Nations says 2019 will be the year of indigenous languages. The UN says nearly 2,700 indigenous languages are in immediate danger, 
with hundreds of others in danger of disappearing at an alarming rate. The United Nations this month will launch this special year. I'm Jason Calvi, and for the entire EWTN News Nightly team, we thank you for watching tonight. We'll be back Monday with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night, and God bless.